Although World War II is often depicted as a conflict between two major alliances, it can be divided into many smaller wars, as the states not willing to join a side were often forced to fight on their own. A variety of factors led to a conflict between Finland and the Soviet Union in 1939-1940, the conflict we now know as the Winter War. In this video, we'll cover the whole of the Winter War, from its origins to the peace treaty. If you're interested in the history of this era, don't forget to check out our second channel, The Cold War. The link is in the top right corner. The sponsor of today's video, Call of War, is a great game for fans of strategy and modern warfare. Call of War is a free online PvP strategy game played by millions of users worldwide. You choose your country, join the war, fight other players in epic real-time battles, and conquer the world in challenging matches that take weeks to win. We like that the game starts in a historically accurate World War II environment, but it still allows you to rewrite history as you want it. To win, you have to use your strategic acumen, strengths and weaknesses of a wide variety of World War II units and vehicles. Choose your own strategy, tank rush your opponents, establish air superiority, or bombard coastal cities. There's a research tree that allows the player to use atomic bombs and other weapons from World War II. Build an empire by waging war on your neighbors and getting into strategic alliances with other players. Call of War is cross-platform. You can play with the same account on PC or mobile. Click on our link below to get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free, only available for 30 days. We've set up a special game of Call of War for the first viewers who click the link in the description. Details at the end of the video. The relationship between Russia and Finland was always tumultuous due to a variety of geographical, political and economic factors. Finland was a constant field of battle between Sweden and Russian entities. The Treaty of Nurtoboy of 1323, signed by Sweden and the Novgorod Republic, divided Karelia, the region populated by the Balto-Finnic Karelians. As Sweden became more powerful over the next few centuries, it took over the rest of Finland and forced the Tsardom of Russia to cede more of South Karelia in 1617. However, fortunes would turn, and by the end of the Great Northern War and the Russo-Swedish War in the first half of the 18th century, Sweden had given Karelia to Russia. The two empires continued to fight, and Russia, supported by Napoleonic France, won the Finnish War in 1809. As a result, Russia annexed Finland, which became the autonomous Grand Duchy of Finland, with its own laws and administration, and the Russian Emperor as its Duke. Previously, a Swedish general, Gustav Moritz Armfeldt, had become an influential counsellor for the Emperor Alexander I, and his influence was crucial in reuniting South Karelia with the Duchy. The early period of liberal Russian rule in Finland gave way to a more autocratic approach over the second half of the 19th century, as Russian emperors made deliberate attempts to Russify the Duchy. However, these methods only strengthened the national identity of the Finns, and the Fenomen movement underlined the yearning for independence. The autocratic policies of Nicholas II led to the assassination of his governor in Finland, which also joined the revolution of 1905 with a general strike. As a result, the autonomy of Finland was removed, and the Russification intensified. In November 1914, an underground student movement started plotting to gain independence, and was supported by Germany. To weaken Russia, the German Empire trained groups of Finns as Jaegers, elite light infantry. In February of 1917, Russia was rocked by a revolution. The Russian provincial government returned autonomous rights to the Finns. However, the internal situation in Finland wasn't great. Both left and right-wing parties vied for power, creating security forces known as the Red Guard and White Guard respectively. After the Bolsheviks took over the Russian government in November, all sides of the political spectrum in Finland were eager to declare independence from Russia, and they did just that on December 6th. The Bolsheviks were not strong enough to prevent this, and by the end of the year, Lenin's government recognized Finland's independence. 
The latter hoped that the Red Guard would make Finland communist and they would rejoin Russia down the line. With Germany and Sweden supporting the White Guard and the Bolsheviks supporting the Red Guard, Finland entered a period of civil war in January 1918. Both sides had around 100,000 troops, but the Whites had former officers of the Russian army and Jaegers fighting for them, and they were led by a talented former general of the Russian army, Karl Gustav Emil Mannerheim. This, and the fact that the Germans occupied Red-controlled Helsinki in April 1918, allowed the Whites to win the civil war in May 1918. 40,000 Finns died in this war. To appease Germany, Finland elected Prince Frederick Charles of Hesse as a king, but even before he arrived, he abdicated due to the revolution in Germany, so the Finns opted for a presidential republic. Finnish nationalists wanted to take over Karelia, and three volunteer expeditions attempted to take the region in 1918 and 1919, all of which failed. Simultaneously, Finnish volunteers participated in the Estonian Liberation War, helping the country to gain independence from the Soviets. At this point, Menaheim created a plan to occupy the capital of Russia, Petrograd, modern St. Petersburg, but the government rejected the proposal. Finally, Finland and Soviet Russia signed the Treaty of Tartu in 1920, establishing new borders, with Finland gaining Petsamo and access to the Arctic Ocean, while ceding Repola and Poryayabi. In 1921, Karelia started a rebellion against the Bolsheviks and was supported by Finnish volunteers. This territory was crucial for the Soviets, as the Murmansk Petrograd Railway was in the region and they moved overwhelming forces to Karelia to secure it. Despite some early success, this uprising was crushed in early 1922. In the same year, the Russian Civil War was concluded, and the victorious union of Soviet Socialist Republics became too strong for Finland to continue these expeditions. Over the next decade, Finland put its faith in the League of Nations, and then its declared neutrality. Simultaneously, Finland enacted a mandatory military training program, and by 1939, more than 180,000 soldiers and officers took part in it. Finland also started building a defensive line from the Gulf of Finland to Lake Ladoga, predicting that the region of the Karelian Isthmus would be the central area of attack of the Soviet forces in a possible war. This chain of fortifications, called the Mannerheim Line after the leader of the Finnish troops, was 150 kilometers long and was built between 1920 to 1924 and 1932 to 1939. It integrated various smaller lakes and swamps along its frontier. Stalin, who became the Soviet leader at the end of the 20s, considered Finland to be a threat. He wasn't sure that the Finns wouldn't support Germany and allow its troops to attack the USSR through Finland. At the same time, the proximity of the Finnish borders to St. Petersburg, then called Leningrad, and to the Murmansk-Leningrad Railway was making the Treaty of Tartu tenuous at best. According to the sources, the Soviet Red Army started building railway tracks towards the Finnish border sometime in 1935, planning to use them in a possible invasion. In 1938 and 1939, Soviet diplomats approached the Finns, asking for a new treaty with guarantees that in case of a German invasion, Finland would fight against it and even allow the Soviets to enter the country and join its defense. Stalin was still reorganizing his army after the Great Purge of 1936 to 1938, so he started to look for allies but was firmly rejected by France and the United Kingdom. As a result, Stalin turned to Hitler and signed the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact with Germany. Officially, this was a non-aggression pact, but its secret clauses divided Eastern Europe into spheres of influence, with the USSR getting Finland, Estonia, Latvia and Eastern Poland. Worried, the Finns attempted to create a Scandinavian alliance, hopeful that a sizable Swedish army would serve as a deterrent. However, this hope was crushed when Sweden caved in to the German and Soviet demands. 
On the 1st of September 1939, Germany invaded Poland and started World War II. In response, the British and French declared war on Hitler. In mid-September, the Soviets invaded Poland from the east. Soon Poland was occupied entirely, despite staunch resistance, its territory divided between the Nazis and the USSR. Stalin immediately demanded that the Baltic countries grant his forces military access, and the latter agreed, allowing almost 80,000 Soviet troops to set up bases. In response, Finland intensified the building of the Mannerheim Line, adding 150 concrete bunkers in short order. On the 5th of October 1939, Stalin summoned a Finnish delegation to Moscow. The Soviets demanded the border along the Karelian Isthmus be moved to the northwest, away from Leningrad. They also demanded the islands in the Gulf of Finland and the Kalasta Yansarento Peninsula, the establishment of a Soviet military base on the Hanko Peninsula, and the destruction of all fortifications on the Karelian Isthmus. In return, Finland would have received Repola and Poyayabi. Simultaneously, both sides started mobilizing their forces under the guise of training, and the Finns began evacuating civilians from the Karelian Isthmus and the cities along the Baltic coast. Even though Hermann Goering approached the Finnish government and asked them to agree to these demands, the Finns attempted to negotiate, giving their counteroffer and receiving another Soviet demand, which they responded to with another counteroffer. On the 13th of November, the negotiations broke down. On the 26th of November, a Soviet border post was attacked in an incident later known as the shelling of Manila. The Soviets immediately claimed that it was a Finnish attack and demanded they move their forces away from the border. Finland denied this and called for an independent commission to investigate the event. Modern sources have confirmed that it was a false flag operation conducted by the USSR to implicate the Finns. On the 29th of November, the Soviets broke diplomatic relations with Finland and one day later renounced the non-aggression pact between their two countries. The Winter War had begun. The leader of the Soviet army in the region was a veteran of the Spanish Civil War, commander of the Leningrad military district, Meretskov, who had four well-equipped armies at his disposal. The 7th Army under Yakovlev had nine infantry divisions plus one tank and four armoured brigades. It was tasked with taking over the Karelian Isthmus and the city of Vipuri and then pushing to the Finnish capital, Helsinki. Although the Soviets knew about the Mannerheim Line, they lacked details and the 7th Army was expected to achieve its goals in three weeks, which was extremely optimistic even considering that the Ladogan and Baltic fleets were going to assist. The 8th Army under Kabarov consisted of five infantry divisions and one light-armoured brigade, and it was entrusted with a breakthrough to the north of Lake Ladoga. The army would then either drive deep or attack the Finnish defenders of the Karelian Isthmus from the rear. Commanded by Duhanov, the 9th Army had four divisions and an objective to take Kiyani and then Olu, thus cutting Finland in two. In the far north, Frolov's 14th Army consisted of two infantry divisions and one mountain division. Frolov, supported by the Soviet Northern Fleet, was ordered to seize Petsamo, as that would have prevented a possible intervention via Norway or the Barents Sea, and then swing south towards Ravaniemi. In total, the Soviet army had 425,000 soldiers, 3,000 artillery pieces, 2,300 tanks and 2,500 planes. In comparison to the 24 Soviet divisions, Finland had just 14, and even those were 20% smaller in terms of military personnel, for a total of 265,000 soldiers. The army of the Isthmus was commanded by Ersterman, and consisted of six divisions, with the 3rd Army Corps on his left flank and the 2nd Army Corps on the right. The 4th Army Corps under Heiskanen was located to the north of Laduga and had two divisions, while the North Finland group, led by Tuompo, was made up of the border guards, reservists and former members of the White Guard. The Finns also had just 500 artillery pieces, 
26 tanks and 270 planes, which meant that the Soviets had an overwhelming advantage in aerial combat and in open terrain. At the same time, the Finns had a shortage of artillery ammunition and even small arms, which meant that they had no hope to win open battles. However, most of the territory that would be initially attacked by the Soviets was impassable for tanks, so they needed a breakthrough to get into the area more suitable for their armour. The Finnish forces were mostly concentrated on the Karelian Isthmus and to the north of Ladoga, with smaller groups in north and central Finland. Those less populated areas were convenient for large-scale guerrilla combat, but on the Isthmus and around Ladoga, the Finns would be forced to fight the Soviets head-on. Despite being heavily propagandized, the Mannerheim line was hardly impassable, as the Finns didn't have enough artillery and bunkers, with its weakest point being near Summa. The line's strongest points were on the Gulf of Finland and Lake Ladoga, as the defenders managed to create effective artillery systems on the nearby islands. Mannerheim expected his army to contain the Soviets for up to six months, after which, he hoped, Finland would be supported by France and the UK. The war started on the morning of the 30th of November with Soviet artillery volleys against the Finnish lines and bombing runs against the nearby cities, leading to civilian casualties. On the Isthmus, the Finnish border was mostly defended by the reservists and border guard belonging to the 11th Division. Although heavily outnumbered, this group was able to hold the Soviet advance for seven days before they retreated behind the Mannerheim line. This stalwart defence gave enough time for other Finnish divisions to take their positions along the line. As the Finns had a more significant concentration of forces on the right flank, the Soviets decided to delay their plans to attack towards Vipuri and continue the advance on their right. Crossing the Voxi River seemed like a great way to split the enemy front, but the Taipale River was a more comfortable crossing, so the Soviet 150th and 49th Divisions were tasked with attacking there. However, this lag allowed the Finnish 10th Division defending there to concentrate more artillery in the area and start shelling the Soviets, leading to severe casualties. The Soviet artillery countervolleyed and their troops began the crossing. Although the Finnish batteries managed to inflict even more damage on the Soviets coming across, and there were counterattacks, by the 12th the Red Army had gained a foothold on the Kokoniemi Peninsula. Here they started waiting for the 49th Armoured Brigade to arrive. At the same time hoping to gain multiple footholds, the Soviets launched an attack on the town of Kivinyemi. As the commander of the 7th Army, Yakovlev, was pressured to make progress as quickly as possible, they attacked as soon as engineer battalions arrived, with no reconnaissance or artillery support. By night, the Soviet infantry crossed the river, supported by amphibious T-38 tanks and some artillery. Yet as the operation seemed to develop successfully, Yakovlev's men faced an unexpected turn of events. When the Soviets reached the midway point of the crossing, the strong current started to drag them downstream, away from where they needed to land. Furthermore, the Finnish defenders caught sight of them and started to open fire from the opposite bank. The Soviets were slaughtered, and only a small force of 30 soldiers and some tanks managed to cross the river using the remains of the railway bridge. The tanks would be unable to make progress, and eventually the force of the waters dragged them down into the rapids. The men, however, quickly went to ground and offered strong resistance, but this wasn't enough and they would end up captured by the Finns. Hundreds of Red Army soldiers died in this failed attack on the night of the 7th of December. Despite that, Yakovlev informed his superiors that he had a foothold and ordered his troops to attack again. His soldiers refused to carry out the order in an unprecedented fashion. On the 8th, Yakovlev was relieved of his duties and replaced by Meritskov himself. Soviet headquarters ordered more troops to join the 7th Army. Meritskov decided that he needed to attack simultaneously along Lake Ladoga and towards Vipuri to put more pressure on the defenders, but that caused even more chaos as the Soviets started moving artillery and armour towards the Gulf of Finland 
and the two small roads in the area weren't nearly enough. This delay was used by the Finns to reinforce and camouflage their positions. So, when the Soviet right flank troops started barraging the enemy, they barely did any damage. On the other hand, Finnish artillery was able to inflict heavy casualties on the Red Army soldiers attacking around the Kokunyemi Peninsula. After each volley, the Finns would move their cannons to a new position, making it impossible for the Soviets to pinpoint their batteries. The Soviets' attempts to make their foothold larger continued until the 25th, but were stopped, losing thousands of troops and almost all of their tanks. However, to the west, Stalin's units managed to gain another foothold by taking Krelia. The Finns were able to bring more troops to the area and started shelling the Soviet foothold. This prevented the Soviets from gaining even more territory to the north of the river, and by the 28th, the remaining Soviet troops were forced to retreat. Thus ended the Battle of Taipalin. The Soviets lost more than 10,000 soldiers, while the Finnish casualties were around 2,000. However, this was just the beginning of the Winter War. On the Western Karelian Isthmus, the initial Soviet attempt to break through was focused on the area between Summer Village and Lake Murlanyabi, defended by the Finnish 1st and 5th Divisions, but it failed. As December progressed, the Soviets continued to concentrate forces in the area. The Soviet 24th Division attempted to push the Finnish 1st from the area around the lake, with no results. A new plan was devised. The 90th, 123rd and 138th Divisions were to join the attack from the west to advance in the area near Summa. The attack was planned for the 17th of December, but the freezing weather prevented the Soviets from using their tanks. Still, after a short bombardment, the 90th Division attacked the Finnish positions. This attack continued until the 22nd, with the Soviets losing hundreds. Only on the last day of the onslaught did the attackers manage to advance a little bit, as their tanks were finally able to participate. The 123rd Division started its attack near Munaswo on the 17th, and its tanks achieved a minor breakthrough, but the infantry lagged behind, and by the end of the day, 23 of 35 Soviet tanks were destroyed. Another attempt to advance was made on the next day, but the Soviets used the same route, which allowed the enemy artillery to destroy many tanks. Soviet artillery lacked munitions in that area due to logistical issues, and the attack didn't happen. To the west, the 198th Division was slightly more successful, managing to get close to the Manaheim Line bunkers. The high point of this attack happened on the 19th, as both divisions advanced, reaching the forests around Summer. Unfortunately for the Soviets, the staging areas of their attacks were targeted by the Finnish artillery with ease, and they were losing dozens of tanks every day. At the same time, the Finns lacked their own armor, so the gains from the counterattack on the 20th were modest. Still, this was largely a stalemate. The Soviets lost thousands. Meritskov sent a telegram to the headquarters basically admitting that a quick breakthrough was impossible, and each bunker would have to be taken one at a time. The Finns attempted to use the concentration of the Soviet troops to the south of Summa. 6th Division, which was near Vipuri in reserve, was sent to the front with an order to attack the southwest of the village and surround the Soviet divisions. Simultaneously, elements of the 5th Finnish Division were ordered to move at Munaswo. This attack happened on the 23rd, but failed due to the lack of coordination with other parts of the front. The Finns suffered almost 1,500 casualties and were forced back. The troops called this poorly planned attack the Idiot's Nudge. The Soviet attacks became more focused after that. The 90th Division was tasked with taking the Popius bunker, but this wasn't an easy task, and in the last eight days of the year, the Soviets lost thousands in that area. Meanwhile, the region of Ladoga Karelia was defended by Haskinen's 12th and 13th Infantry Divisions, facing off against the Soviet 8th Army under Khabarov, tasked with moving 90 kilometers inland in 10 days. The Soviet 18th and 168th Divisions were to attack between Lakes Ladoga and Yanis, 
while the 56th was to attack the Loimala crossroads and the 1st Rifle Corps was to advance to the north. The 1st Rifle Corps' initial attack was successful, and it took the strategically important Swayabi on December 2nd. Elements of the 12th Finnish Division tried to counterattack, but were forced back by the superior Soviet firepower, taking casualties. Some Finnish units started retreating beyond the Kola River in order to avoid being outflanked from the north. Mannerheim was not happy, reacting by replacing Heiskanen with Hegland and sending Group Talvela to reinforce this front. This new force attacked the village of Swayabi from the northwest, which diverted the Soviets' attention and allowed the battered Finnish units to the south some respite. After a short pause, the Soviets started attacking along the front on the 8th, but as was the case on the Karelian front, the Finns used the time they had to reposition their artillery, which inflicted heavy damage on the attacking troops, particularly the tanks. On the 12th of December, the Soviet attempts to cross the frozen lakes to the south of Finnish positions along the river Kola also failed. The Finns crossed the Kola and counterattacked, destroying a number of tanks and artillery pieces, which led to Kabarov's replacement by Stjern. On the same day, the Soviets attempted to encircle the enemy from the north by crossing Lake Swoyabi on skis, but were stopped once again. As the temperature plummeted to minus 25 degrees Celsius on the 18th, the Soviet headquarters ordered the 8th Army to halt the offensive and defend their modest gains. The Finns were less perturbed by cold, and on the 20th, launched a counterattack against Natalia, which connected the crucial Loimala Pitsieki Railroad. This counterattack, along with one on the 23rd, was unsuccessful, but it prompted the Soviets to attack in that area, hoping to break the line. These attacks continued until the end of the year, and the Soviet losses were considerably higher than those of the Finns. On the southern part of that front, the 56th and 158th Soviet divisions outnumbered the 13th Finnish 3 to 1, and as the defenders' positions were overrun around Kesnaselka, they retreated and formed a defensive line in Kitila and to the north of it. The Soviet advance reached the area on the 11th. Thankfully for the defenders, they had coastal artillery on Valamo Island and in the village of Salmi, which was used against the armor, destroying a number of tanks. The Soviet plan near Kitila was to attack the village itself with the 168th Division and use the 18th Division to advance towards Lakes Siskiyabi and Rokoyabi. Although some advance was made to the south of Siskiyabi on the 12th, the Finnish fighting retreat was costing the Soviets dearly. At the same time, the initial rapid Soviet advance stretched their supply routes. Most of the tanks were kept back both as a deterrent against a counterattack and to save fuel. The defenders wanted to exploit this, and a counterattack was ordered on the 12th. The plan was to cut off the Lemeti Road and either surround the Soviet 168th and 18th Divisions or force them back. Three task forces were created to tie down the enemy or strike deep in the first major Finnish counterattack of the war. Task Force Archer moved towards the lakes Kotayabi and Saksyabi, avoiding the roads. On the one hand, that allowed them to avoid the Soviet troops, but on the other, when they finally came into contact with the enemy near Kotayabi, they were too exhausted and didn't proceed much, save for one battalion, which managed to capture a section of the road to the south of Saksyabi. Task Force Bullet attempted to move towards the lake Hakiyabi and then south to Saksyabi but was also sighted by the Soviets and forced back without reaching its objective. Meanwhile, the defensively oriented task force Ram had a critical situation, as the enemy managed a minor breakthrough around Kitila station. However, they managed to push the Soviets back and plug the gap in the defenses. As the attempts to cut the Soviet forces on the Lemeti road failed, the leaders of the Finnish 13th Division decided to attack towards Mitro in order to split the Soviet 18th Division. That was a logical decision, since its units controlled a wider front than the others. However, the two-pronged attack was unsuccessful, and once again the Finns had to retreat with casualties. Using that, the Soviets moved the units of the 18th Division, taking Rokoyabi and getting to the south shore of Lake Siskiyabi. 
The Finns once again tried to stop this attack by counterattacking towards Mitro, but were repelled. Unfortunately for the Soviets, they also were suffering casualties, especially from frostbite. So by the early hours of the 17th of December, the Finns retook Rokoyabi and territory around Siskiyabi. Task Force Archer was moved to the west and attempted to cut the Soviet supply lines to the southeast of Lake Siskiyabi. They actually succeeded on the 18th, which forced the Soviets to divert more troops from the southeast to restore their line of communication. However, that meant that their divisions were not getting the requested reinforcements. Their foe was going to use that, and the Finns started to attack across the front. For the first time since the beginning of the war, the Soviets had to defend, and although they were successful, on the 27th, Task Force Bullet attacked to the southeast, taking Urmar, which cut the Lemeti Road, making it impossible to supply the Soviet divisions quickly. The Red Army's attempts to retake Urmar failed repeatedly, and their 168th and 18th divisions were attacked constantly. By the beginning of January, the Soviet salient at Siskiyabi was pushed towards the Lemeti Road. The Finns were still outnumbered on this front, but their dogged resistance and deep raids not only stopped the Soviet attack, but created an opportunity for the Finns to go on the offensive in January 1940. Meanwhile, to the north of Lake Swoyabi, the Soviet 1st Rifle Corps pushed the Finns back 60 kilometers away from the border. This was a crucial region for the Finns, and they couldn't have afforded to retreat more, as that would have opened the troops around Laduga to attack from the north. To stem the tide, Manaheim appointed Colonel Talvala and reinforced him with additional troops, collectively known as Group Talvala. The colonel was a hero of previous wars, and his appointment immediately improved morale. Still the Soviets pushed, and on the 8th of December took the river crossing over Kivisalmi. Talvala needed to do something drastic to change the situation, and on the night of December 9th, Task Force Payari counterattacked. A third of the unit tied up the Soviet forces across Kivisalmi while the rest crossed the lake and attacked the enemy 139th Division from the south. Apparently this attack surprised them, and the Soviets not only suffered losses from Finnish fire, but also started shooting at each other in confusion, which continued long after Piari returned to his initial positions. This daring raid also helped with morale. At the same time, as was the case on other fronts, the Red Army moved too quickly in this area, which stretched their supply lines and made further attacks more difficult. Reinforcements were requested, but due to the nature of the war, they wouldn't arrive in the region until much later. Most of the Soviet troops needed some rest, but that allowed their enemies to dig in. To the north, the Soviet 155th Division was finally stopped by the Finns. More dangerous for the Finns, was the arrival of the Soviet 718th Regiment to the area in the center of their line, which threatened the integrity of the front. Swinging west around the side of Tolvayabi village, the 718th managed to surprise and encircle the defenders. Yet as the Soviets were overcoming the Finnish line, their attack came to a halt when they managed to secure their soup kitchens. This is because the men of the 718th were so hungry after a five-day march that they immediately laid down their weapons and proceeded to gorge on hot sausage stew. As unusual as this incident was, it gave the Finns the respite they needed to reorganize and receive reinforcements. Now under the command of Colonel Aro Payari, the Finns launched a surprise counterattack on the night of December 10th that soon turned into a fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat. By dawn, the 718th had been finally repelled, and over a hundred Soviet corpses lay on the snow with pieces of sausages still on them. Such was the effectiveness of Payari's surprise attack that some of the enemy soldiers even died with food still in their mouths. After the so-called Sausage War, some Red Army troops to the south attempted to assist the fleeing 718th but they were stopped in the area of Lake Tovayabi, suffering hundreds more losses. 
Talvala didn't mind continuing this wave of victories, but his soldiers were as tired as their counterparts, so the front was quiet on the 11th. The Finns had planned a counterattack for the next day. Task Force M would attack the enemy head on to the north of Tobayabi village, while Piyari would attack from the flank. In this attack, the Soviets were forced back, losing more than 1,000 men and valuable equipment against 300 losses for the Finns. Over the next day, the Finns pushed the invaders so much that the Soviet leadership was forced to bring in the 75th Division from Swoyabi to assist the retreating 139th. This played a role in the replacement of Khabarov with Zhen, which we mentioned previously. However, the strict disciplinary actions of Zhen didn't improve the morale of his soldiers. The Finnish attack in the area continued until the 16th, when they reached the village of Aglayabi, pushing even the fresh troops to the east. Both sides started concentrating more troops in the area during the next day. Although the Finns had the initiative, their attack on the 18th and 19th ended in failure. The Soviets brought tanks to the village and used them to start a counterattack on the 20th, but the Finnish anti-tank guns proved deadly, destroying them and allowing the Finns to counterattack. By the end of the day, the Red Army's troops were squeezed into the village. Despite the fact that the Soviet air forces attacked the enemy over the course of these days, the forest terrain rendered their runs ineffective. The Finnish attempts to take the village continued and on the 21st of December, the Soviet leadership finally gave the order to retreat to the Itayoki River. The Finns attempted to cut the retreat and killed many Soviets, but the encirclement failed. Still, Aglayabi was the first major victory for Manaheim's army during the war. The Soviets lost around 6,500 men in these battles, while the Finnish casualties were fewer than 800. In the north, General Viljo Tuompo had only one mission, to assemble his scarce forces and mount a defensive line in the huge 800 km long border that runs from Lieksa in the south to Petsamo on the Barents Sea. The Soviets, meanwhile, had two objectives, to cut off Finland from its border with Sweden by seizing the important port of Ulu in the Gulf of Bothnia and to take the strategic port of Petsamo on the Barents Sea and then advance on to Rovinyemi. The Soviet 9th Army of Commander Mikhail Dukhanov was in charge of the offensive against Ulu, but the only road accessible for the Soviets led first to the village of Swomosalmi. The town would first have to be taken if Dukhanov wanted to ever reach the coast of Bothnia. At dawn on November 30, 1939, the 163rd Motor Rifle Division advanced near the hamlet of Lonka. The commander of the division, Andriy Zelensev, divided his forces for a two-pronged attack on Swomosalmi, with the 759th Regiment advancing through the Rate Road and the 81st and 662nd Regiments advancing towards Palavara. But at Yundusranta, Zelensev lost control of the 662nd, led by Colonel Sharov, which struck north towards Hapevara, leaving only the 81st to attack Swomosalmi from the north. Meanwhile, the 759th encountered the Finnish 15th Battalion at the Pereksenjoki River. The Soviets assaulted the defensive line on the frozen river several times, but were repelled. On December 3rd, the Soviets managed to encircle the defensive positions, forcing the Finns to retreat. Failing to notice that their foe had retreated, the Red Army waited a full day for their artillery to arrive, and then another day to bombard the now deserted defensive line. Further south, the elite 54th Mountain Rifle Division was sent to advance towards the town of Kumo in a pincer movement against Swomoselmi. Commander Nikolai Gusevsky of the 54th had planned to directly assault the Finnish positions on the Rasti crossroads with the 118th and 337th Rifle Regiments, while a Soviet company would attempt a flanking maneuver to the north in the Kierkinkoski area. By December 6th, fighting began on both fronts, and the Finns barely held their ground against the firepower of the Soviet division. In response, General Tuompo appointed Colonel Axel Vwoko to lead the defense of Kumo, who quickly set out to the front lines with his men. Reinforced with the 25th Regiment, 
Vorko launched a counterattack against Gusevsky's southern flank on December 8th. The Finns, fighting tooth and nail, managed to repel the 54th's men, and then executed an encirclement maneuver to the north three days later. Although the offensive's main goal of defeating the Soviet division wasn't achieved, the 54th was now surrounded, and Gusevsky's advance had been successfully stopped. Meanwhile, the Soviets managed to break the Finnish line in Kierkinkoski and advance up to Lake Tirovara by December 13th. There, General Twompo formed Detachment Kekkonen, a small force composed of approximately two companies. This detachment managed to halt the Soviet advance and on December 24th launched a counter-offensive to expel them from the Cuomo area. Outnumbered, the Soviets were forced to retreat back to Kierkinkoski. Yet Tuomo ordered Detachment Kekkonen to pursue its foe, and on December 28th, the Soviet company was surrounded and destroyed. With their northern flank secured, the detachment was assigned to reinforce Vorko on the Rasti crossroads. By conducting small-scale guerrilla attacks, the Finnish colonel would successfully maintain the 54th away from Cuomo until more men could be assigned to finish off the Soviet division. At Suomisalmi, only a small force defended the town, as the Finns didn't think that the Soviets would invade through the vast virgin forests of central Finland. The overwhelmed Finns held out against the 81st's attack until December 7th, when they finally decided to retreat towards the south side of Lake Kjandajavi. Suomisalmi was put to the torch before the withdrawal, as the Finns didn't want their enemies to get the town's resources. The following day, the 759th reached the town from the south and regrouped with the 81st. Despite their initial success, Zelensev had suffered many casualties due to Finnish resistance and frostbite, and now his forces were dwindling. At the same time, Colonel Hjalmar Selaswo took command of the disparate Finnish forces scattered in the Suomisalmi area and regrouped them into Task Force Selaswo. Their objective was to take back the key town of Suomisalmi. On December 11th, the Finns started their counter-offensive, severing the invaders' line of communication from Rate on December 13th and cutting their northwestern supply route two days later. The Soviets wouldn't sit idly by waiting. Zelensev attempted to repel the Finnish forces, but he was pushed back to Suomisalmi. And from the east, Dukhanov sent the 44th Rifle Division to reinforce Zelensev, although the forward elements of this division were also repelled by the resilient Finns on the Rate Road, led by Colonel Johan Makiniemi. But Selaswo was also struggling with holding down the northwestern route, and his attacks into the village were failing as well. By the night of December 18th, Selaswo decided to pull back although he nevertheless kept sending small forces to disrupt Soviet preparations. On the Rate Road, Selaswo reinforced Makinyemi's forces with one howitzer and a machine gun company. From the 17th to the 24th of December, the Finns defended their control of the road, with 350 men against an overwhelming 14,000 soldiers from the 44th. These soldiers were elite, but they had been demoralized by the Finn terror so despite their numerical advantage, they couldn't break the position of Task Force Selaswo. Trapped in Suomisalmi, Selensev knew that the situation was unbearable. Having lost 1,500 men, the commander asked the Soviet High Command permission to retreat, but he was denied, as they believed the 44th was finally approaching. Meanwhile, at Hapavara, Sharov 662nd was stopped at the shores of Lake Pispayabi by the Finnish 16th Battalion under Major Polari. Outnumbered, Polari held off the Soviet advance and started a counter-offensive on December 8th that managed to throw the invaders on the defensive. Polari himself was wounded though, and Colonel Pavo Sisadaival took command of the battalion, quickly forming Task Force Susi north of Palavara. Their objective was to recapture Palavara and from there move on to take back the main Soviet supply route through Yundusranda. On December 11th, Susidaivel intercepted a radio transmission from which the Finns learned that the 662nd had lost 10% of their forces from frostbite and that reinforcements were not coming to aid them. 
Susidaival then sent the 16th Battalion to take Palavara, but the Finns faced heavy resistance and only managed to take the crossroads by December 13th. On December 14th, as Susidaival was preparing for the counter-offensive, Sharov launched an ill-advised attack towards Katola village. The Soviets were defeated, losing 150 more men and had to retreat. Desperate, they started moving southwards, trying to link up with Zelensev's forces at Swomisalmi, but they were stopped by the 16th Battalion at Pelovara. Furthermore, Susidaival chased them from behind and surrounded them. In an act of cowardice, Sharov abandoned his men and escaped back to the Soviet Union. The 662nd fought tenaciously, but only 300 men managed to retreat to Yundus Randa. When they finally reached friendly soil, they saw their courage rewarded with the execution of Sharov. On December 22nd, Dukhanov was replaced by Commander Vasily Choykov due to his incompetence. Despite the fact that most of the 44th were still in transit, Choykov ordered Zelensev and the 44th's commander, Alexei Vinogradov, to commence a simultaneous assault on the Finns, trying to gain a breakout. In the end, Zelensev started the attack alone on December 24th and was forced to halt it by Christmas. Meanwhile, General Menaheim reinforced Selasvo with the 9th Division to prepare for a final assault on Swomisalmi. As the 44th was amassing at the Rate Road in front of the Finns, Zelaswo decided to use his forces to attack Zelensev from the northwest of the village. Four battalions were assigned to Task Force Kari under Major Kala Kari for this assault. On December 27th, the operation started, with Kari's forces advancing over the frozen lake Oraviselka towards Hokoniemi. There, Kari was halted by Zelensev's 81st Regiment, and a chaotic struggle ensued. By night, the 81st had suffered many casualties, retreating back to Swomisalmi to regroup with the 163rd. The Soviets continued to offer fierce resistance until the early hours of the morning, but the Finns could tell they were starting to break. As the battle was quickly turning against them, Soviet High Command finally authorized Zelensev to retreat back to Yundusrenda. On the night of December 28th, the Soviets started crossing the frozen lake Kyantayarbi to the north. A day later, only a small force remained in the village. They were destroyed by Kari, who managed to successfully reoccupy Swomisalmi. Salaswo's offensive had been a success, and just in time, as the 44th had at last assembled on the Rati Road. As Salaswo had taken the initiative, and Sisidaival was marching his forces to take Yundusranda, Vinogradov felt as scared as his men were for the situation they were in. His division was highly mechanized and didn't have enough room to maneuver on the small forest road. His Ukrainian men didn't know how to ski, and the forest spoke Finnish as the enemy fell on them. For him, it was a deadly trap to be on the Rate Road, so he asked permission to withdraw, but the high command wouldn't allow him. On December 30th, General Twompo ordered Salaswo to destroy the 44th Division, reinforcing him with the 1st Sisi Battalion of specialized ski troops. As soon as the 9th soldiers had rested after the fearsome battle, Salaswo started to send them to reinforce Makinyemi's position. Sisi was placed southwest behind the front, with the objective of looping around the enemy lines and attacking towards the town of Haukala, while Kari was ordered to circle towards Alavoki, proceeding in the direction of Rate from the southeast. On January 1st, Mekinyemi launched a frontal attack against Haukala, where Vinokradov's main forces were concentrated. By afternoon, Sisi suffered heavy losses while attempting their objective and would have to be recalled, but one of Mekinyemi's battalions managed to advance through the road undetected and capture the Soviet artillery on the road. Vinogradov launched one counter-attack after another, but he couldn't dislodge the Finns from their positions. By the end of the day, he was forced to take up a hedgehog defensive formation, placing the 146th Regiment in defense of the southern flank. At this point, Kari had reached the frozen lake Vokiyabi and was planning to attack the following day. Near Sanginaho, the entrenched 146th managed to repel Kari's attempts to break through, 
but with their supply route compromised, Vinokradov's forces started to starve. Furthermore, the freezing weather was inflicting a heavy toll on the 44th's strength, and whenever the Soviets started a campfire to warm themselves, the Finns would open fire with their machine guns from the forests. On January 3rd, Task Force Kari was assigned to assault the town of Sanginlampi, the main base of the 146th. As their initial assault failed, Kari decided to encircle the Soviet position with a pincer movement the following day. The Finns slowly progressed through the Soviet defences, causing them 300 casualties before their foes' withdrawal. With Sanginlampi under his control, Kari defeated a tank counterattack and advanced a few kilometers to the north of the town. Food and ammunition were running low for the Soviets, the 146th had been pushed back to the road, and the Finns were constantly harassing them. Meanwhile, reinforcements arrived from Yundusranda to relieve Makinyemi's forces. Salaswo knew the situation was ideal and so he gave orders to encircle and destroy the enemy in the area between Lake Kokoyabi and Haukila using a tactic known as Moti. For these attacks, the Finns ploughed winter roads through the snow away from the enemy positions. These functioned as jumping off points, allowing the defenders to mass troops together quickly and undetectably. Although the Finns failed to occupy the Rate road as planned, the Soviets were now surrounded both from the north and south so they couldn't withdraw or move from their positions. On January 6th, a battalion of the 9th managed to capture a section of the road near Lake Kokoyabi and immediately dug in defensive positions. Later that day, Kari managed to sever the road west from the battalion and then take the Soviet artillery at Kokoyabi. At this point, Haukala had been completely encircled in Amoti and Salasvo commanded his forces to cut the Rate road at multiple points creating several smaller moti. In the end, Vinogradov had no other choice but to retreat eastwards towards Lake Kokoyabi, even in spite of High Command's orders to fight to the last man. The Soviets gathered on the road for one last chaotic breakout attempt, suffering heavy casualties against Finnish machine gun fire. But at Kokoyabi, the Soviets found that Kari had taken this position and was waiting for them. The 44th's troops were soon defeated and fled into the woods in desperation. Meanwhile, Choikov had sent the 305th Rifle Regiment to rescue Vinogradov's men. They cleared a 9km channel from the border into Finland, enabling the Soviet soldiers that managed to flee to the forests to successfully escape. By January 7th, the Rate Road was completely in Finnish hands. Makinyemi's men alone had captured more than 1,000 prisoners that day, and the 44th Division had ceased to exist as a fighting unit. The loss of more than 4,000 men and much equipment, including vehicles and horses, was a heavy blow to the Red Army. The Soviet High Command's decision of maintaining the 44th in its place while Zelensev retreated was a huge mistake, and although Vinogradov had wanted to retreat from the start, he would pay for that mistake with his life. Meanwhile, Manaheim awarded Salaswo and his men with his gratitude as this great victory was celebrated in Helsinki. But the war wasn't over. In the far north, another operation was taking place at the same time. Commander Valerian Frolov and his 14th Army invaded the area around Petsamo on November 30th, trying to cut off Finland's only Arctic port. Furthermore, Frolov was supported by the 122nd Rifle Division of the 9th Army, striking towards central Lapland. The port of Petsamo had been placed under the defence of Task Force Penanen, a small unit with the strength of three companies. In contrast, the Soviet commander had three fully-fledged divisions at his disposal, and he planned to use them in the best way possible. As such, he had reserved the 14th Rifle Division to protect the Kola Peninsula from foreign landings, while the 104th Mountain Division was tasked with capturing their vital objective, the port of Petsamo and the nickel ore mines that surrounded the area. On the morning of November 30th, the 104th advanced across the border seemingly unopposed through the Kalasta Yasarento Peninsula and the Petsamo area. The Finns knew that they were heavily outnumbered, so in response, 
They prepared to execute guerrilla tactics to delay the advance of Frolov's 9th Army. This is why the defenders decided to burn the village of Petsamo to the ground, then retreating to some better defensive positions in the town of Ilalostari. Although the port had been raised to prevent the enemy from getting its valuable supplies, the battle for the Petsamo area was far from over, and as the 104th's advance was slower than expected, Penanin had ample time to better organize his scarce forces. On December 3rd, the Finns managed to halt their enemy at Yela Lostari while preparing to retreat to the next delayed positions at Mayarbi. With some favorable defensive positions, Penanin would successfully resist any further assaults by the 104th until December 15th. But this time, Frolov didn't simply sit and wait. Instead, he reinforced the 104th with the fresh 52nd Rifle Division and launched a renewed offensive against the Finnish line. Captain Antti Penanen and his men were barely holding their ground against the might of Frolov's 52nd Rifle Division, but the Soviet advance was slowed down due to temperatures below minus 40 degrees Celsius. Realizing he didn't have enough men to defend Petsamo, Penanen retreated south and started a tiring campaign of attrition against the 14th Army. Frolov had successfully achieved his objective of taking Petsamo and the nickel ore mines of the region, but his new orders to push south saw his army constantly harassed by small Finnish raiding parties. By the end of the year, the relentless winter and sniper attacks had completely halted Frolov's advance. Further south, Colonel Peter Shevchenko's 122nd Division was rapidly progressing towards the town of Sala. Shevchenko's objective was to capture the capital of the Lapland region, Rovinyemi, and then advance to the port of Tornio on the Gulf of Bothnia. In response, General Tuompo had assigned the defense of the village to Major Vilho Roininen. Task Force Roininen had been hastily retreating from the border ever since Shevchenko started his advance. He knew that his force was no match against the 122nd, and despite receiving reinforcements on December 6th, he would have to surrender the town three days later. As Twempo's main forces were in the region of Suomisalmi, and he had his full attention on that front, on December 13th, defense of the Lapland region was assigned to a separate force, Group Lapland, led by General Kurt Valenius. Valenius quickly decided that the Soviet advance had to be stopped, and so he started forming a defensive line in front of the town of Kemiyabi. While Valenius tried to call on reinforcements, he placed Reuninum, who had by now mustered four battalions, as the main defense unit on Lake Yotseyabi. By December 15th, Shevchenko believed that the Finns weren't able to build a strong defense in the region, and with the reinforcement of the 273rd Mountain Rifle Regiment, he decided to split his forces. He sent the 273rd towards a northerly route, past Pelkoseniemi village, with the objective of cutting off the supply routes of the Finnish forces still fighting in the Petsamo region. Meanwhile, he would lead the 122nd to directly assault Kamiyabi. Despite their defenses, the Finns were worryingly struggling with the 273rd drive northward. In response, Valenius got the command of the 40th Regiment and placed it at Pelkosenyemi. But by the time the 40th arrived at the village, it was already too late, with the 273rd ferry crossing the Kitanen River to the north edge of Pelkosenyemi and establishing a bridgehead. On December 17th, the two forces chaotically clashed at the bridgehead. Despite the Finns' well-thought-out counterattacks, the Soviets pushed forward tenaciously, and eventually, two tanks broke the Finnish line. But as the Finns were fleeing, the Soviets were suddenly hit by an undetected Finnish relief force that managed to rout them with ease. As the invaders began to retreat, leaving behind precious equipment, Valenius felt relieved that the 273rd's advance had been stopped and that Pelkosenyemi was secure. The 273rd would go on to retreat back to Saya village, where they wouldn't be a threat for the remainder of the war. From December 17th onwards, the 122nd launched repeated attacks on Reunanum's forces, but the Finns held firm. 
On December 20th, Shevchenko split his forces across a three-pronged attack that would encircle and then crush the Finnish defences. But Reuninen was prepared for this, and he commanded a limited counterattack on the south side of Lake Yotsuyabi that sent the Soviets packing. Shevchenko's assault had failed miserably, with his forces ending up encircled in a moti. On December 21st, Shevchenko was ordered to establish a temporary defensive position in order to regroup and prepare for another attack. But Valenius wouldn't allow his foe to regroup. He reinforced Reuninen and prepared to break the Soviet lines on January 2nd. The Finnish assault was a failure, and this prompted Shevchenko to attempt a breakthrough three days later. Troikov tried to reinforce the 122nd with the 88th Rifle Division, but on January 13th he realized these forces wouldn't arrive on time, and so he ended up ordering Shevchenko to withdraw back to Lake Makayarbi at Sala. The Soviet forces proceeded to fortify their positions on the west bank of the lake, while the Finns set their own troops into an extended semicircle in front of these defenses, preparing to recapture their town. Valenius placed Task Force SFK in command of the operation, a force composed of Swedish and Norwegian volunteers led by the Swedish general Ernst Linde. Linde managed to repel any further attacks by the Soviets, but he lacked sufficient men to encircle and destroy the 122nd. Sala would remain in control of the Soviets for the remainder of the war, but the Lapland group would see complete success in their objective of containing the invaders. The loss of Petsamo and the nickel ore mines was a hard one for the Finns, but the Lapland and Olu regions had remained largely untouched, and that was celebrated back in Helsinki as a great victory. Our story resumes in the Kitala area, where the situation was more desperate for the Soviets, with the 168th and 18th Rifle Divisions being on the brink of encirclement. On January 3rd, General Hegelund started to prepare his 13th Division for a major offensive aimed to destroy the Soviet forces right where they stood. For this, the Finnish regiment that had previously captured a portion of the Woma Road was reformed into detachment cannon with orders to hold and reinforce their position at the roadblock. Task Force Archer, in defense of the Kitala crossroads, was depleted to dangerously low levels to create two new offensive forces. First was Task Force Bumblebee, led by the 13th Division commander himself, Colonel Hanu Hanuksela, that had to attack directly into the flank of the 18th. Second was Task Force Dragon, which was to advance from Lake Puheyabi to Cannon's position, with the objective of capturing the rest of the Wuma Road, defended only by a Soviet tank brigade. On January 6th, the Finnish offensive started with a feint against the Soviet positions. At the same time, the two main task forces sprang into action. Hanuksala managed to gain control of the road, bisecting the 18th Division, while Task Force Dragon controlled the same road further east, completing the encirclement. As the Soviet units didn't panic or launch a counteroffensive, the Finns continued with their maneuver, establishing two moti around the 18th's headquarters at Lemeti. As a result, Hegeland quickly ordered them to continue the attack towards Korvinoya on the shores of Lake Ladiga. If successful, the 168th would be completely cut off from the rest of the Red Army. But Hanuksala knew better. First, they needed to secure their grip over their two large moti and repel any relief attempts by the rest of the 18th Division. Furthermore, temperatures below minus 40 degrees Celsius were taking a heavy toll on both sides, but especially on Task Force Bumblebee. Once the two moti were secure, the Finns started their advance south in encirclement of the 168th Division. By January 9th, Task Force Dragon had occupied the Koivuselka hamlet, cutting off the Soviet supply route to Pikkerenda, while Hanuksala proceeded to Pukitsanmaki, a small hillock overlooking the Pitkerenda road. The next day, both forces joined at Korvinoya and captured the town, thus preventing their foe from escaping southwards. 
Although the Finns had created 11 independent moti between Kitala and Korinoya, the encircled Soviet forces defended their ground with great tenacity. Furthermore, the Soviets were bolstered by a large number of pack animals and were still being supplied by air, so they weren't going to be starved into submission. A week later, the Finns had managed to strengthen their position along the Pitkaranta road, but the Soviets were still resisting tooth and nail. When Hegeland was reinforced by the 64th Regiment, he immediately created Task Force Race to strike at the new enemy formations approaching Pitkaranda from the southeast. This was the 11th Rifle Division, commanded by Pyotr Borisov, and their attempts to re-establish a connection with Pitkaranda would fail throughout January and early February. On January 22nd, Hanuksala started an attack against the Western Lemeti Moti. The following day, the Finns occupied one of the Soviet fortified bases, but the offensive wouldn't see much progress overall. On January 27th, Hegeland ordered a renewed attack to be carried out by several small assault forces. These were largely unsuccessful, but one of them managed to capture two heavy mortars. With these deadly weapons, the Finns split the enemy forces and reduced them by February 4th. Further west, Task Force Ram had managed to encircle the 208th and 316th regiments in early February. Despite the Finns' relentless attacks, the Soviets managed to resist submission, and on February 17th they attempted a breakout. This action would decisively fail, and the Soviets would be cut down almost to a man. On February 5th, the 11th Division was ambushed by Task Force Race, and Borisov himself perished in the struggle. Leaderless, the 11th ceased all their attempts at relieving their fellow countrymen, and adopted a passive stance instead. Further to the northeast, where the Finnish 12th Division had barely managed to halt the Soviet advance against the Lamola crossroads, the Finns continued to offer dogged resistance at the Kola River. Colonel Lauri Tiainen had very few forces, but he needed to reinforce his fellow countrymen to the south with the objective of cutting off the rest of the 18th Division. On January 12th, Tiainen created Task Force Tiger to assault the Soviet strongpoints at Uma. By January 17th, Tiger's two battalions had managed to cut off the road on both sides of the village, while the rest of Colonel Tiainen's forces proceeded to take control of the Urma road, creating three new moti. Just like in Lameti, however, the Soviets resisted fiercely, preventing Task Force Tiger from capturing their objective. Back at Kola, the depleted Finns were reinforced by the 23rd Division. But when the Soviet offensive on the Karelian Isthmus began, only the 69th Regiment could be spared to remain on this front. By the end of the month, the 69th was already fighting over the frozen river when Tiainen fell ill, so command of the division was reassigned to Colonel Anteros Svensson. This man would soon face a perilous situation as the Soviets regrouped for a new offensive. On February 12th, Soviet High Command reinforced the 11th Division with the 34th Motorized Division, and both forces were reorganized into the 15th Army under Commander Mikhail Kovalyov, with the objective of renewing the offensive against the Pitkaranta Road. As further attacks on Pitkaranta failed, Kovalyov would be replaced by Vladimir Kurtchimov, and the Soviet High Command sent them the 144th and 119th motorized divisions as reinforcements, although their arrival would be seriously delayed. On March 6th, Kurtchimov ordered the 34th to start a general offensive on the Pitkaranda Road. The Finns were entrenched on the islands south of Koirinoya, and a bloody struggle ensued, but despite the heroic Finnish resistance, the 34th was highly successful, capturing the large Petayasari Island and the key Maximansari Island. Over the next few days, the last of the islands were cleared, and a supply route could be finally established to the 168th Division, encouraging them to continue to resist Finnish attacks. Meanwhile, the Finns retreated to Koirinoya, where they established solid defensive positions. These positions would hold on until the end of the war against the full might of the 15th Army. 
The retaking of the supply lines, however, brought much hope and courage to the encircled Soviets. In early February, the Soviets trapped around Lavayarbi succeeded in a breakout, getting 810 men to safety. But not every attempt would be so successful. At Lake Sariyabi, the Soviets had all been killed or captured after their breakout failed at the end of the month. The two Moti at Uma and Sira, meanwhile, would hold on with dogged resistance until the end of the war, without attempting any escape. On February 28th, the 18th Division's headquarters at the eastern Lemeti Moti attempted their own breakout under the cover of night. The Finns were taken by surprise, but they managed to inflict 400 casualties on the fleeing Soviets. Although the Soviets managed to break through the Finnish line, they ended up encountering heavy Finnish opposition on the shores of Lake Vuotaneyabi, where the division command was destroyed. Only 1,200 soldiers managed to escape, 900 of them wounded. The 18th Division ended up suffering over 9,000 casualties, the heaviest on any unit in the entire war. In contrast, the 168th Division continued to offer fierce resistance around their perimeter until the end of the war, although suffering heavy casualties as well. After the victory at the Pitkaranta Road, the Soviet 8th Army had more forces available to reinforce the Kola River front. Towards the end of February, Commander Grigory Shchern had amassed six divisions to carry out a renewed offensive against the Finnish positions including the 1st Rifle Corps that had retreated from the Battle of Elayabi. Stjern's plan was for the 1st Corps to attack in a three-division-wide front to prevent any encirclements, while the 14th Rifle Corps to the south flanked the Finnish defences and enveloped them. On March 2nd, the Soviets started their offensive with a preliminary bombardment. By midday, the three divisions of the 1st Corps and the 128th Motorized Division from the 14th started their advance. Despite the great superiority in numbers that the Soviets enjoyed, Colonel Svensson had prepared for such an assault, setting up barbed wire obstacles and arranging his forces in defensive positions to take advantage of the deep snow. The frontal assault of the 1st Corps failed, but the 128th to the south fared a little better, as after crossing the Kola River, the Soviets managed to advance to the eastern ridge of Lake Hinatsilyampi. The following day, the 1st Corps resumed its attack, breaking through the barbed wire at some points. But the Soviets suffered massive losses for little gain, as the Finns killed everyone that managed to make it to the breach. High Command was furious at this failure, and after a few days of recovery, they ordered Stjern to start the offensive again on March 7th. In a change of plans, the 87th Rifle Division of the 14th Corps was reassigned to support the 1st Corps' assault, while the 128th started to turn directly northwards in an attempt to fold the Finnish lines in on themselves. After a preliminary bombardment, the 1st Corps renewed its offensive, this time, the 56th Rifle Division managed to cross the Kola River and establish a bridgehead while repelling several Finnish counterattacks. Their courageous effort would be in vain though, as the other Soviet divisions were stalled in the deep snow. In the end, the defenders managed to push back the 56th and regain their main defensive line. The Finns continued to resist the Soviet attacks in the following days, but despite receiving reinforcements, on March 10th, the Soviets finally took control of the defences along the river. Meanwhile, Svensson sent the 34th Regiment to stop the 128th Division, which managed to slow down the Soviet advance. And in the north, the 75th Rifle Division finally took their hill objective, repelling Finnish counterattacks to retake this vantage point and breaking through the defences on the Loimola Road. By now, however, the 56th Division was too depleted, and had to be relieved by the 87th Division. Despite Finnish manoeuvres to stop the 87th in its tracks, this division had joined the 56th on March 12th to start their attack on the road. Although the southern Soviet assault had failed, the breaches in the north and centre of the line forced the Finns to abandon almost all of their positions along the Kola River. 
but as they were retreating, Svensson decided against any further retreat and started preparing a combined counterattack to regain the river front. This counteroffensive, however, would be prevented by the end of the war. Despite Soviet success on the previous day, the battle had not ended in victory for either side. This would be crucial for the negotiation of a ceasefire, as Mannerheim needed the Kola line to hold on to gain a better bargaining position. It was on this front that the prodigious sniper Simo Helha fought, serving in the 6th Company of the 34th Regiment. Although Helha himself didn't keep track of his own achievements, his comrades did. Early in December, he had managed to kill 51 enemy soldiers in just three days, which was unbelievable even to his superiors. The Finnish officials then placed him with an official observer that attested to 542 confirmed kills in a space of just 100 days. Through his service, he would be promoted to junior sergeant while dispatching many troublesome enemy snipers. The legend of his prowess and achievements soon extended throughout all the known world, and he became known to the Soviet soldiers as the White Death. On March 6th, while adopting a high-knee shooting position, Helha was shot in the face with an explosive bullet which pierced his left cheek. Although he was proclaimed dead, he actually survived and managed to recover with the help of 10 operations. He would never return to frontline service though, and he would go on to live until the age of 96, finally dying in April 2002. Further north, Group Talvela had managed to stabilize its situation at the Itayoki line, as the 1st Rifle Corps was ordered to retreat for the renewed assault against the Kola River. As a reward, Colonel Pavo Talvela would be promoted to Major General for his success and determination. But in February, their northern position at Lieksa was threatened by the elite soldiers of the 54th Mountain Rifle Division advancing against the town of Kumo. Led by Commander Nikolai Gusevsky, if the 54th could breach the Finnish defences, they could drive south in a pincer movement against Lieksa or north against Soma Salmi. In fact, it is in Lieska where one of the least known battles of the Winter War took place. Almost 200 kilometers to the northwest of Eglayabi, Gusevsky had sent the 529th Rifle Regiment in a two-pronged attack to capture the critical crossroads of Lieksa. The town was defended by the North Karelia Group under Colonel Erki Rapina, although this was just a small force composed of three battalions. In the morning of November 30th, a Soviet battalion attacked the southern Inari guard post while the main bulk of the 529th advanced through the northern Kivivara road. After evacuating Inari, the Finns retreated to Palkinyabi for the night, where they were reinforced by a Finnish battalion and then continued on to the Visikoyabi line, where they set up a strong defensive position that managed to halt the Soviet advance. Yet in the north, Rapana was facing a more perilous situation, with the 529th and the Finnish 12th and 13th battalions clashing over the frozen Lake Anakaina. As the Finns saw their efforts to counterattack thwarted on December 3rd, they would be finally forced to retreat to Lake Purinyabi. The Finns would then quickly fortify their new stations at the Peru line, and these would manage to be strong enough to stop the Soviet progress. While the Russians were stymied in front of the Finnish defenses, Rapana would prepare for a general counteroffensive against the 529th. On December 24th, Christmas Eve, the day finally came to counterattack. On Visikoyabi, the Soviets were soundly defeated, retreating back to the other side of the border with haste. And on the Purunyabi, Rapana's forces executed a Moti tactic by cutting off the road behind the enemy. Taken by surprise by the unprompted Finnish maneuver, the 529th broke off before the Finns could accomplish their goal and then withdrew back to their starting point. Yet when the Finns arrived at the border by December 26th, they were surprised to find the enemy stations empty. This was because the 529th had withdrawn completely from the front lines, and now the road was clear for the Finns. One day later, Rapana's men would reach Kivivara, 
where they would remain in protection of the road south to Lieksa until the end of the war. The Soviet attack on the Lieksa region had been defeated, but now Gusevsky's 54th Division was threatening again to break the Finnish lines and advance over the North Karelia group with the full might of his motorized division. In the previous months, the 25th Regiment had managed to halt the advance of Gusevsky's forces with the execution of small-scale guerrilla attacks. But once Colonel Hjalmar Salasvo from the North Finland group had secured victory at Suomasalmi and the Rate Road, he was ordered to take his 9th Division to the defense of Kumo. By the end of January, when Salasvo arrived at the front, Gusevsky's forces had already dug defensive positions along a 45-kilometer road. Salasvo would use the same Moti tactics that he used back in Rati, preparing ice roads and setting jumping off points for his soldiers. Salasvo's men were highly experienced in these Moti tactics, and on January 29th, the soldiers would start to execute the encirclements. In a matter of hours, Gusevsky's men would be surrounded by five Motis, suffering tremendous losses. The following day, the bulk of the 9th Division was engaged in pinning down the trapped 54th soldiers, while Colonel Johan Makiniemi led a strike force to capture the strategic Lutovara Hill, preventing any further Soviet relief attempts from the east. When the hill was captured on January 31st, General Choikov assembled a task force of two ski battalions to dislodge the Finns from Lutovara. But this task force was catastrophically disorganized, and over the next few days, Makanyemi destroyed the ski battalions almost to a man. The Soviets, though, still regrouped at Kilbalankangas and prepared to renew their assault, which alarmed Salasvo. He sent several attacks against this position until the Soviets had to retreat to Rihivara on February 9th. Two days later, the Finns started an all-out attack against Gusevsky's headquarters at Luelati. For a total of four days, the tenacious Soviets managed to hold the Finns at bay, but then a new threat appeared from the north. On February 11th, the Soviets had sent a ski brigade under Colonel Vyacheslav Dolin to cut off the Finnish supply route, and he had managed to break contact with Finnish forces in the Kierkinkoski area. This was because Dolin had been handed highly inaccurate maps, and the route he ended up taking caught even the Finns by surprise. But this would ultimately be his doom, as the Soviets were now trapped at Vetko and the Finnish snipers were quickly pinpointing them. On the morning of February 15th, almost 400 Soviet bodies lay on the battleground, Dolin himself among them. Troikov then tried to relieve Gusevsky by sending the reformed 163rd Division on February 25th, but this force would also be repelled by the ferocious Finns at Lutovara Hill. From March 1st onwards, Salasvo bombarded the Lulati Moti with 4,500 shells in total, the heaviest bombardment executed by the Finns in the entire war. Each day, the Finns paid a high cost in lives in order to gain a little bit more ground from the dogged Soviet troops. On March 8th, the defenses of the Luolati Moti were finally overcome, with half of Gusevsky's men managing to flee to the Rukovara Moti. The Finns then proceeded to turn their focus against Rukovara, but Gusevsky would hold on until the end of the war a week later. This was Salasvo's costlier campaign, losing more than 4,500 men in the struggle against the 13,000 men that the Soviets lost. But in the end, it would be a success, as they critically crippled the 54th as a fighting force and managed to secure the flanks of Suomoselmi and Lieksa. The Finnish victories at Eleyabi, Kitala and Uma in combination with the stopping of the Soviet advance at the Kola River and Kumo, brought much hope and relief to Helsinki, and contributed enormously to the peace talks at the conclusion of the war. Meanwhile, the poor performance of the Red Army on all four fronts had shown the Soviet high command that the offensive operation had many flaws. 
Commander Kirill Meretskov had underestimated the size of the Finnish forces, their resistance, and ability at guerrilla warfare, and the sturdy and well-prepared defences on the Manaheim line, and in turn, they had been slaughtered by the enemy. Meretskov would see himself replaced by the high command due to his failure. The new man in charge of the operation, Semyon Timoshenko, would go on to give the Soviets a new fighting chance to prove to the world that they wouldn't be defeated so easily. The Soviet high command was highly disillusioned by Meretskov's performance and decided to replace him with Timoshenko, sending him 21 fresh divisions to prepare for a renewed offensive operation. As such, the 7th Army was reorganized into the Northwestern Front under Timoshenko himself, with Zhen's 8th, Troikov's 9th, and Frolov's 14th armies directly reporting to Marshal Voroshilov's high command. Timoshenko was ordered to breach the Manaheim line by any means necessary and bring the war to the Finnish heartland. Meretskov was then reassigned to lead the new 7th Army on the western side of the front, with 14 divisions in total as he received five as reinforcement. Furthermore, nine new divisions were assigned into the newly assembled 13th Army under Grendal, placed on the eastern side of the front, and the other seven divisions were designated as general reserve for the operation. With so many troops on a single front, the Soviets had to divide their forces to maintain control over them, with Meretskov forming five army corps and Grendal forming three. In contrast, the Finns on the Manaheim line were worn out after a month of intense fighting. Their fortifications were in a bad state, as throughout December and January the Soviet artillery had shelled their positions daily. And the Finnish forces were not only exhausted from resisting the Soviet onslaught, but also from repairing the dugouts and assault obstacles after the relentless enemy bombardment. The commander of the Army of the Isthmus, General Osterman, had grouped his troops into two formations, the Western 2nd Army Corps around Summa under General Orquist, and the Eastern 3rd Army Corps in the Taipale sector, led by General Heinrichs. Behind them, the Finns had the poorly manned interim line, with only a few emplacements and facilities for the defence of these positions. And behind this, lay the final obstacle for the Soviet advance, the inadequately fortified rear line, which ran from Vipuri to Kupasari, and from there to Kagisalmi. Although the Finns were heavily outnumbered, with only eight divisions against the overwhelming 30 Soviet divisions, the defenders were prepared to fight to the last. On February 1st, Timoshenko launched his offensive. On the Summa and Lada sectors, the 3rd Division of Colonel Palu had been hammered by several small Soviet assaults throughout January. When Meretskov's forces approached the Manaheim line, it took a while for the defenders to realize this was no small attack, but a full army assaulting them. Within hours, the Soviets managed to capture a section of the trenches while bombarding the entire line. Each day they renewed their attacks, focused on acquiring a bunker here or a dugout there. These assaults were very successful, and some positions would remain in permanent Soviet control, further lowering the morale of the Finns. Despite these losses, Palu had withstood the Soviet assaults by February 10th. But this was just the beginning, as one day later, the 19th and 50th Rifle Corps started a joint offensive. The star of this offensive would be the 123rd Rifle Division, which managed to push through the Finnish lines just east of Lake Suma and capture Poppius Bunker and all the strong points east of it. By afternoon, their attack had breached the Manaheim line and reached the interim line at Lada. Meanwhile, Palu threw back the Soviet attacks at other locations along the front and launched a quick counter-offensive against the 123rd. This counter-attack, however, lacked the arms and men needed and thus failed. As Manaheim became aware of the breakthrough later that night, he immediately ordered the Reserve 5th Division to the breach. In response, the Soviets started reinforcing the 123rd to capitalize on their success. Two battalions from the 5th hastened to counterattack the enemy, 
but despite pushing back the Soviets, they would be driven back by Soviet tanks later that day. As the defenders recovered from their failed counter-offensive, the Soviets started a bombardment of the interim line and their armoured forces rolled straight through the Finnish defences. Furthermore, just east of the Lada Road, the invaders had created a gap in the defensive line. The following day, the Soviets would continue to widen the breach while General Orquist threw every available reinforcement to stem this. If Lada fell, the Soviets could open up a passage in every direction through the Isthmus. In the meantime, fierce combat was taking place in the murky sector as the 19th Rifle Corps slowly progressed through the line of the 1st Division at great cost. By February 13th, the 90th Rifle Division had breached the Manaheim line at Murky and managed to push in several kilometers. That night, Commander Meretskov noted their tremendous success and ordered his corps to exploit this opportunity. At the same time, Orquist gave permission for the 5th to start withdrawing eastward and for the 1st to retreat towards the northeast. On the other side, the Soviets would not follow the disengaged Finns, instead consolidating. Meanwhile, Grendal's 13th Army had the objective of advancing through the Finnish defences to the road network on the Kelia Korpikula Yaroseva line. On February 8th, the Soviets started their bombardment of the Taipale sector and the 3rd Corps launched a wide front assault, resulting in the capture of two bases at the Tarentula hamlet. Two Finnish counterattacks had failed to regain it when a third desperate effort managed to return these positions to their hands. Suffering heavy losses, General Heinrichs had halted Grendal's assault, but just as in summer, this was just the beginning. On February 11th, the Soviets started a strong bombardment and launched a renewed offensive. The Finns fought tooth and nail, and at the end of the day, they would still be in control of their main defences. Furthermore, a surprise attack near Savanto forced the Soviets to relinquish their newly captured positions. This came at a hefty price in manpower, and the 7th Division's soldiers would have to be reinforced with the fresh 21st Division. For the next week, the defensive line waved back and forth as the defenders kept recapturing the positions lost on the previous day. By February 17th, Heinrichs had withstood the main Soviet assault, and now the situation was stable for the Finns at Taipale. When Grendal realized this, he ordered the 49th and 150th Rifle Divisions to cease their attacks and instead wear down the defenders with an incessant bombardment. On February 14th, Manaheim arrived to assess the situation on the front line. He quickly concluded that despite holding most of the main defences, the breaches at Lada and Murky forced the Second Corps to retreat to the interim line. One day later, the exhausted and battered Finns started their retreat, and the Red Army allowed them to do so. By February 17th, all Finnish forces had made it to their designated positions at the interim line, and they would be reinforced by the 23rd Division coming from the Kola River. The last Finns to withdraw were the soldiers of the 4th Division on the Koivisto Islands, who escaped by skiing over the frozen Vipuri Bay to its west bank, establishing critical defensive positions at the islands around the city of Vipuri. Meanwhile, the Soviets kept applying pressure resuming attacks against the new line immediately after their enemies had manned it. On February 22nd, the 23rd finally arrived to relieve the depleted 5th Division, and together they managed to halt the Soviets for a few days. At the same time, Ostermann was replaced by General Heinrichs. Furthermore, the experienced General Tavila would take control of the 3rd Corps and General Latikainen would be assigned to command the new 1st Corps at the left flank of Orquist's 2nd. By February 18th, Grendel had restored the cohesion of his forces and ordered them to renew their assault. This offensive was especially successful around Kervis Mackie, where the 150th Division routed a battalion of the 21st and took control of the strongholds on the southern side while the 49th Division captured the forts at Tarentula, 
forcing the Finns to retreat to the interim line. After the fall of these defensive positions, the Soviets stopped their advance because they feared a Finnish counterattack, allowing Tavala to strengthen positions on the line one day later. The following night, the 7th Division launched a counteroffensive and took back control of the Tarentula sector. This position would go back and forth between the Finns and the Soviets, but by February 24th, the 7th Division had established more permanent positions. In March, Tavala issued a final retreat into the well-prepared bunkers of the rear line, but the war would end before Tavala reached and defended this last line. In the meantime, the 2nd Division of Colonel Koskimius would soon fall back to the concrete bunkers of the Arapa sector. As Taipale had proven too resilient, Grendal now directed his forces against these positions in the center of the interim line. Reinforced by the 19th Corps, the 23rd Rifle Corps was pushing north with the objective of securing the village of Antrea, while further east, the 15th Rifle Corps was assigned to cross the Vorsky River near the village of Arapa. Koskimiers resisted the Soviet attacks as best he could, but by February 29th, Grendal exercised complete control of the interim line west of Arapa, forcing the 2nd Division to retreat to the rear line. But from the village eastwards, Koskimir still controlled his defensive line, so Grendal ordered the 15th Corps to launch an offensive against Arapa's defenders. The commander planned to first destroy the defenses on the south side of the Vorsky and then proceed straight across the Finnish rear to take the village. In turn, Koskimiers left the 23rd Regiment to defend Arapa from the western assault of the 4th Rifle Division, while he came forth to the east to receive the combined attack of the 17th Motorized and 97th Rifle Divisions. On March 1st, the Soviet offensive began, achieving a breakthrough the following day. But this wouldn't last, as later that day, Koskimiers managed to recapture the lost positions and push back. As a result, Grendel was replaced due to his repeated failures by Perusinov, who immediately issued new orders for an assault. This offensive would fail as well, but on March 4th, the 50th Rifle Division defeated the 8th Division and took a strategic hill east of Vosalmi. With the elevated firing positions against them, the Finns south of the Vuoxi River and at Arapa would have to retreat to the shores. After the capture of Arapa, Perusinov continued his offensive against the large Vasikasari island in the center of the river. Although Koskimiers kept offering fierce resistance, the following day the 50th Division captured the island with great losses. On March 6th, the Finns attempted to regain the island, but Perusinov's forces repelled them and counterattacked, establishing a position on the shores of Vosalmi. A fierce struggle ensued, in which Koskimiers ended up victorious, pushing the Soviets back to Vesikasari. Following this success, he would be reinforced by the 21st Division, and together they would manage to hold on until the end of the war. Meanwhile, as the rest of the 50th Corps continued their assault on the Lada breach, Meretskov had formed a new task force consisting of two tank brigades and two infantry battalions to take Vipuri on February 28th. But one day earlier, Urquist's forces had fully retreated to the still incomplete rear line, preventing this new offensive from ever launching. Meretskov, however, had managed to overrun the interim line in its whole length, and he was now preparing his forces for a final assault on the last Finnish defensive line. Right in front of Vipuri, the 3rd and 5th Divisions stood as their main obstacle, with the 4th Division protecting the bay to the west of the city. And immediately east from them, Lachikainen's 1st Division had taken positions east of the Tali crossroads, with the 23rd Division at its west in the town of Repola. Meretskov planned to do a two-pronged attack, with the bulk of the 7th Army skirting the city from the east to encircle the Finnish forces, while the 10th and the reservist 28th Rifle Corps had to cross the frozen bay west of Vipuri to secure the road to Helsinki. 
At this point, the Finnish government was working day and night to resolve the conflict peacefully before the invaders could do tremendous harm to their capital. The rear line had to be held, and Vipuri couldn't fall if they wanted to avoid complete occupation. Towards the end of February, overall command of Vipuri Bay was handed over to the newly formed coastal group, led by the experienced general Valenius. Their situation was very perilous, as the bay was frozen, allowing Soviet tanks to cross it, and by March 1st, the Soviets had forced the 4th Division to retreat from the two large peninsulas extending into the bay. Valenius then placed his forces on a line of islands extending to the port of Vipuri, directly facing the three divisions sent by Meretskov. When the offensive began, the 800-strong defenders at Tupura managed to hold their ground against the invaders, but they couldn't stop them from occupying the smaller islands just north of the line. The following night, however, the Finns at Tupura found their position untenable and had to retreat to Tekasari Island. They would continue to resist there for an entire day before retreating to their final position at the Vilanyami Peninsula. At the same time, Valenius faced a great threat when the Soviets skied over to the Haranpanyami Peninsula and drove back the coastal defenders. But by March 3rd, the peninsula was back in Finnish hands. This forced Valenius to order a retreat from the island line to concentrate at Turkinsari, but despite his best efforts, he would then be replaced because of the disorganized state of his forces. In the meantime, Meretskov launched his eastern offensive against Vipuri on March 1st. The 34th Rifle Corps had the task of directly assaulting the city from the south and from the northeast, where the 5th Division stood in defense, while the 50th Corps advanced in the direction of Repola to eliminate the 23rd Division. On March 2nd, the 3rd Division defending Vipuri itself was assaulted by the 7th and 95th Rifle Divisions, and the Soviets managed to create a breach on the southern edge of the city. But the 3rd would continue to hold the Soviet attacks on the following days, further preventing the invaders from sweeping into the city. Simultaneously, the heroic 1st Division was holding down the 50th Corps on the Tali crossroads, and the 5th and 23rd Divisions were also resisting the relentless enemy attacks. Back at the bay, the new commander of the coastal group, General Lennart Usch decided to recapture the key Taikasari Island on March 4th. This would fail, and soon the 86th Motorized Rifle Division created a bridgehead on the Haranpanyemi Peninsula. Usch quickly launched a counterattack to regain this position, but by March 5th, the 86th couldn't be dislodged. At the same time, the Finns in Vilanyemi were finally routed so the Soviets continued eastwards towards Vipuri until they were stopped on the Kayanyemi Peninsula. The next day, Ursh attempted to recapture Vilanyemi, with both sides suffering heavy losses. Although the Finns had contained this breach, the Soviets had managed to cut off the road to Helsinki, achieving their main goal. With Vipuri isolated from the capital, Finnish Prime Minister Ristoriti was finally granted permission from Moscow to travel there and start the peace talks. While these negotiations lasted, Heinrichs and Mannerheim knew that they needed to hold the invaders at bay. On March 9th, the 70th Rifle Division on Vilanyemi was reinforced by the 173rd Motorized Rifle Division, and one day later, they advanced northwards beyond the road. Towards Vipuri, they would finally be stopped by the recently assembled Group Varko coming from the city. Meanwhile, on Uras Island, the 4th Division was enjoying great success on March 9th against the 43rd Rifle Division, and only after being reinforced by the 42nd and 113th Rifle Divisions did the 43rd manage to capture the island. The rest of the island would be lost the following day and the 4th would have to retreat to the Koivuniemi Peninsula in defense of the coast. Simultaneously, Meretskov launched a new main offensive against Vipuri on March 11th. But the Finns fought to the last man and resisted both the artillery barrage and the Soviets' incessant attacks. Orquist's position was becoming untenable with each passing day, 
and so he requested permission to abandon the city. But Manaheim knew the importance of maintaining Vipuri, and he knew that the war was near its end, so he ordered his men to maintain the city at all costs. On March 12th, Meretskov was preparing for a final assault on the surrounded Vipuri, coming both from south and west, but before the Soviets could exploit their breakthrough on the city, Ruti capitulated to Stalin's terms. A day later, the terms of the Moscow Peace Treaty were announced, and the fighting stopped. Immediately, the majority of Heinrich's forces started to withdraw to the newly agreed borders, while the depleted 3rd Division remained in Vipuri to lower down the national flag, as the city had been annexed by the Soviet Union. The territorial losses that Finland suffered ended up being more than what the Soviets initially demanded. Although the war ended in defeat, it was remarkable that the Finns had managed to hold on for so long against the Soviet onslaught. The Finnish casualties were around 70,000, 25,000 among them dead. More than 150,000 Red Army soldiers were killed, and 200,000 more were wounded. The Soviets also lost around 400 aircraft and more than 3,000 tanks, which would prove to be important when Hitler attacked the USSR 15 months later. The attack that the Finns joined, starting the Continuation War. The sponsor of this video, Call of War, allows you to take command of your nation's army during the darkest hours of human history, the Second World War. In this free online strategy game, you get to fight up to 100 other players in real time and rewrite the history of World War II. To support our channel and download Call of War, click on our link below and get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free, only available for 30 days. We've set up a special game of Call of War for the first viewers who click the link in the description. Go to the website or app, search for Kings and Generals, and enter the password Kings and Generals to access the game. We will continue covering modern wars in the upcoming weeks, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.